today, a friend. But he's also a friend of ours, and we had two or three days ago Mayor Bill Clinton. And I think those people who really appreciated the Clinton presidency and the Clinton White House and the way he worked for our mayors, if it were not for James Carville, we might never have had Bill Clinton. And I really mean that. So we've asked James to come and talk about where we are right now. But we also ask him to come because he loves Mitch Landrew. He's his friend. He's a neighbor. And he's from New Orleans, Louisiana. James Carvel, please. Thank you so much. Thank you. Well, I, I want to really thank you for scheduling me following a guy that just gave $200 million away. What? You talk about a tough act to follow. <laughs> uh, man, if you hope, I, I, Miami, God, I love Miami. And it takes such pride, like New Orleans, and it did, you know, being a coach, it's the gateway to Latin America. And I'm always reminded, when I think of Latin America, I think of former Vice President Dan Quayle, who went down to the Caracas Chamber of Commerce when there was such a thing in Caracas, and he proclaimed that he loved Latin America and he loved the people of Latin America, and his great regret in life was that he never learned to speak Latin. My friend, Mayor Landrieu, uh, you know, Mayor, you know, been in politics for a while, and Mayor Landrieu first got into politics, we both had hair. <laughs> Donald Trump was a Democrat, and the president thought Russia was an evil empire. How things have... <laughs> and uh, my wife was supposed to be here, because people always wonder where kind of famously uh, on opposite sides of the political spectrum. And unfortunately, uh, she's fine, but a tree fell on her foot. <laughs> but she's going to be fine. And why is it that Mary and I, who agree on nothing in politics, agree so fervently about Mitch Landrieu? And I'll tell you what it is. During World War II, there was a saying, and there was probably some truth to it, there were no atheists in foxholes. Well, there are no ideologues in City Hall. Every mayor, Republican, Democrat, independent, anything else, is just interested in one thing. What works? How do we get to here tomorrow? What are you bringing to me that can help me? And there's no time. There are no, there are no Bernie bros or Tea Party people, anything like that in City Hall. You, you're in there, and you're dealing with real problems in real time. And when you – I am a, a son of rural America and a citizen of urban America. And I think back, Mayor Landrieu, and when I moved to New Orleans in 2008, and it quickly dawned on me that this was a kind of dicey deal here. <laughs> it wasn't going great. And what really, really matters <clears throat> at, the, at the core of everything is leadership. And decisions that politicians, yeah, politicians, decisions that they make have a profound impact on not just everyday life, but everyday life pushing forward. And when I was listening to Mayor, then Mayor Andrew talk as Lieutenant Governor, and he took a particular interest in culture, in the relationship of culture to life. And most people in most cities that you go to, it's a very important distinction, you worry about quality of life. And you say, well, we, we put in and we get a this much for park space and we get this much for days of sunshine and we get this much for libraries and this much for graduation rate and this much for hospital beds and this much for universities and then you total it up. And voila, we all move to Eugene, Oregon <laughs> or someplace because it had more points than somebody else. They won by Pittsburgh beat. Cincinnati by two points, so that everybody rejoices. The difference, the difference in New Orleans is we don't speak of a quality of life, we speak of a way of life. And that way of life is drilled in us. 
And our mayor understands that without a culture and without a big part of our economy being cultural, we have our own music, our own food, our own funerals, our own social structure, our own architecture. And so at the end of the day, what we feel is what are we doing to preserve our way of life? We're not going to give up red beans on Monday for a two degree drop in the humidity. That's just not what we're about. And we had a mayor that understood that, how fragile it was to keep our traditions. You know, one of the things that they work on is when New Orleans music, you don't learn it at the conservatory. It's passed down. And, and things are passed down and it's traditional. And, you know, people say, well, it was nepotism and the land rooms. Well, I'm proud to say that we're the first city to have two father and son combinations as presidents of the United States Conference of Mayors, the Morales and the Land Roofs. And, you know, it, it, may I remember this used to say, no one ever said we don't need another Manning playing football, another Marcellus playing music, or another Brennan in the kitchen. So we sort of embrace nepotism in our city. It's not a bad, it's not, you know, it's a good thing. But I, uh, then what I've learned in being in national politics, and I think I've worked in 22 different countries, when you live in a city, you feel it. You have a relationship. You have a relationship with the streets. You have a relationship with what's going on. You have a relationship with the sewer line, with the water, with the, the, the Things get clogged up. You have, you know, we have drainage issues. We have all of that. And as I look back, and you think of things like that is sort of scut work that no one thinks about. How about renegotiating a deal with the firemen that the firemen have a secure retirement and the city has a secure bond rating? That's hard stuff. That's not glamorous. That's not cutting a new ribbon. But that's every day of being a mayor and what our mayor does. And you're right, people at some level don't understand that. And it is about, and as Mayor Bloomberg pointed out, is it, it is about doing difficult things. It's about supporting these schools in New Orleans that have made probably, we're probably the single, single most improved urban school district in the country. And thank you also, Senator Landrieu, for being supportive of that, which wasn't always the easy thing to do in Louisiana if you were a Democrat. That was not the easy call. Very famously and very correctly, we made a, the mayor made a very difficult call that was very necessary. We're, you know, we're 300 years next year. Whatever we are, we're still standing. And we have a long and glorious history And we can acknowledge it, but we also can choose to accentuate and glorify that which should be glorified about our history. And there is much to glorify, and much in the talents of our people, much in the culture of our people, much in the achievements. So we really want every one of you to come down and help us celebrate this. And it's, you know, the thing that I want is I left Louisiana, and I, my grandmother grew up in New Orleans, and what I really want is that if my children stay in New Orleans or decide to come back as I did in my 60s, that it will be there. And it will be there the way it is. It'll be there, they will recognize what the music sounds like, what the food tastes like, the social structure, what a carnival crew is like, and all of these things which are so important. And we had a mayor, in the most critical time in our history, and I mean that, the most critical time in our history, who understood our people and our culture and what made us different and was willing to do different and courageous things to secure the future of our city. And so, Mayor, I think it's just a, on behalf of Mary, and I think I'll speak for no one can speak for every New Orleanian. I'm not going to be that presumptuous, but I think... <laughs>
I speak for, for every thinking New Orleanian that, <laughs> let me see, one, two, three. <laughs> And it, just what a, what a terrific job that you have done for our city and how you have put us in the spotlight and the things that you've done to make life so much better for all of us. And this is a fitting testament and tribute to the work that you have done, to the values that you have, to the understanding of who we are and what we're about in doing all of the things that we need to secure a future for our city, which is very fragile environmentally, very fragile in a lot of other ways, but I, I've never felt better about the future in New Orleans than I do now. And when you're 72, it's good to feel good about the future of anything. <laughs> so <laughs> I, uh, I really thank you, and I'm just delighted to talk to you and see my see, see man. Thank you for good, what, what a great scheduling job you did, Tom. So thank you all very much, and let's participate in the honor of having you there. Thank you so much, Mayor. Okay. Um, what is past is prologue. This follows up on more about a great, a great man that we, we knew, and if he had lived until May 29th of this year, he would have been as old as his mother, 100 years old. But let's look at this film and think about where we are today and where we gotta go from today. Let's look at the video. I'm here in Shaw to discuss with you a problem which is not local but national, not northern or southern, eastern or western, but a national problem, a national challenge, a problem and challenge and responsibility and opportunity which will be before us all in the coming months and indeed in the coming years. And I'm talking about the problem of race relations. What happens in Birmingham or Chicago or Los Angeles or Atlanta depends in large measure upon the leadership of those communities. We will back you up. We will work with you in every way possible. But the mayor of every metropolitan city in every section of America must be aware of the difficult challenges he now faces and will face in the coming months. On your return from this conference, you can set an example in your communities to which the timid can rally and which those clinging to the past cannot ignore. I ask you to join with me as a fellow American, as a responsible citizen, as one who occupies a position of responsibility, as one who must in the final analysis themselves solve these problems, which cannot be solved in Washington, to recognize the rights of all Americans in guiding along constructive channels in working along constructive ways as a free society must to attain a peaceful revolution which will not only avoid disaster but much more importantly fulfill our highest obligations. Ladies and gentlemen, as we look at our history, we are today experiencing something that has happened five times. Five times. In 1933, 1934, Sims Wamsley was elected president of this organization. Four more times, Ernest Dutch Moriel, Moon Landrieu, Mark Morrell, and now Mitch Landrieu. The history of this city 
the presidential history of this city surpasses any city in the United States of America. We've had, we've had, we've had more presidents from New Orleans than we've had from New York, Chicago, Los Angeles, Burnsville, Minnesota, Columbia, South Carolina, Gary, Indiana, and York, Pennsylvania. And so today, we have to look at our history. And I want to say a few things about a, a man I worked for in 75 and 76. His name is Moon Landrew. 72, James, we were at the Roosevelt Hotel. I never will forget it. The band started playing Dixie. You know, back then when we, when Georgia came out on the field, we played Dixie. I'm a dog, you know. He's LSU. This is a religious issue, this <laughs> Southeastern Conference stuff. But seriously, uh, uh, Moon w walked up to the band and said, if you, play that, if you play that damn song one more time, you're going to leave. Now, this was in 72. I'm not going to, as, as Mitch has taught us, we all had our way towards race. But I want to show you a clip of a great American. And I've often said, James, that if Moon Landrieu had Hamilton Jordan on his staff, he would have been president instead of Jimmy Carter. That's how, that's how good a politician he was. And I observed, uh, this is my 47th or 8th year, and I really believe it. So let's watch this clip of the other Landrieu who was our president, Moon Landrieu. I didn't even know the flag was in the chamber until I got elected and took my seat. The year was 1969. The Former Mayor Moon Landrieu was 36 years so old and an at-large member of the New Orleans City Council, full of social and racial justice theories, coming off six years of serving in the Louisiana House of Representatives, fighting segregation policies. That's when he says he noticed the Confederate flag inside the New Orleans City Council chambers. And I told them I'd like to get the flag out of the chamber. I didn't think it was serving as well. And only Philip Siasio kind of agreed with that. Other five members didn't. Without enough support, the flag stayed, stationed among others at every council meeting, until, says Landrew, Eddie Saper joined the council. The current former judge and legislator was new to politics back then. Like Landrew, he wanted the flag to go. So I said, I've been waiting all my life for you, man. Where have you been? I think both of us were from a younger generation. We didn't see any reason to perpetuate a, a cause that was lost and a cause that was not justified to start with, which was the perpetuation of slavery. Together with some supporting council members, Landrew and Saper had enough votes to remove the flag. On May 16, 1969, Saper filed a motion which reads, the only flag to be permanently stationed in the council chambers of City Hall shall be the flag of the United States. Why, after close to 100 years, are we still arguing about this thing. It's over with. Now let's get on to trying to correct the damage that was done rather than keep inflicting these insults on a minority population. From 1970 to 1978, Mayor Moon Landrieu desegregated city government and public facilities, appointing African Americans to top positions. Decades later, the debate continues in several places over the flag's meaning and message. I think I was absolutely right in what we did, but I didn't certainly do it with any sense of heroics. It was just something that had to be done. Let me, let me just make, uh, thank you, Moon. Let me just um, hit two or three points, if you don't mind, Mayor Andrew. Um, about 18 mayors decided to go to Detroit City in 33 and 34, the Great Depression. 
and Sim Wamsley was on the plane. Went to the Cadillac Hotel, and they said, we gotta go talk to Franklin Della Roosevelt. So this city, <laughs> the city of New Orleans, started us in Detroit City. Then you had a situation in 75 and 76. New York City was going under. The Chancellor of Germany said, you can't let this happen. Mayor Bloomberg, we didn't realize just what a strong budget that was. I mean, you, you, but the budget then was the second largest budget, government budget. And we, we all were doing business in Kansas and a lot of wonderful places. But the city was going bankrupt. And, and Landrieu said, Moon Landrieu said, we must meet. And the mayor of Denver said, and the mayor of Anchorage, Alaska said, we are in a tenement house. And if New York City goes bankrupt, we burn. I'm on the fourth floor, they own the first floor. So again, New Orleans was there to save New York City. You go right on down to President Reagan's budget. Ernest Dutch Morial called me. He said, let's come to Washington. We brought hundreds and hundreds of people arguing, arguing for a fair budget because uh, the Reagan administration wanted to abolish everything that we had for cities. They wanted an army and a navy and a Marine Corps. And he fought that battle. Then, in 2001, Mark Marrell became my president. We were sitting in the Occidental Hotel with David Broda. It was his birthday. It was the, and the screen came up on 9-11. And, 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 and Mark was my president. And we immediately called for a federalization of the securities of the airport. And, and we know, and Mayor Bloomberg knows we were there with you to recover. We took the winter meeting to New York City. Now, where, we are, where are we right now? Every, every organization, every faith-based organization, every nonprofit organization, they're looking to the mayors of the United States. They're looking to the mayors of the United States to get us through the political turmoil we're now in. So glad that Mayor Bloomberg is here. He's right, Manny, you're right. He's our world mayor. But let me tell you something. We have a leader coming up that's going to really be there for all of us. Ladies and gentlemen, the 75th President of the United States Conference of Mayors, Mitch Landrieu. Thank you all. You, <laughs> what do you say in a conference that has been blessed with so many different wonderful leaders that have said so much? I will try. The first thing that comes to my mind is what would have happened had Jack Kennedy and Martin and Robert not been taken from us too early. That is a thought worth contemplating. And so I suppose the best place for me to begin uh, is with thanks. I'm thankful to God for his blessings and for his mercy. I'm thankful to uh, James who came today and Mary uh, and of course, even though she couldn't make it, they are a personification that bipartisanship is alive and well in America. I'm particularly thankful to my friend and my mentor, uh, Michael Bloomberg, who just demonstrated to us again today how incredible uh, an impact one human being can have. You know, Michael, I've often said that uh, a person cannot be great if they're not good, and my friend, you are both. And I want to thank you for the commitment that you've made to the people of America. <laughs> to Mayor Levine and to your entire team, uh, unbelievable. Mayor Diaz, thank you for help laying the groundwork. Uh, your team did an incredible job making this such a huge success, and we really appreciate it. Uh, to Mayor Cornette, Mick, you and Terry, 
Uh, you guys have been unbelievable. You have led us through a very uh, difficult year, and we are going to miss you, uh, and we thank you for that. To Tom and to all of his staff, these guys work year in and year out to make us all look good, uh, and I want to thank you to make this, for making this organization so strong. Uh, to Mayor Benjamin and Mayor Burnett, I look forward to your leadership. It'll be a partnership that I hope uh, will last for a very, very long time. To all of my fellow mayors that were able to stay with us, and that has uh, become uh, the mayors that are making America great again, I really think that uh, you're doing an incredible job, and I look forward to your leadership, and I look, thank you for serving uh, all of us in the years to come. To all of my staff, everybody knows us. We're, we're only as good as the people uh, that are assisting us, and many of them are here today. You guys, I love you, and I thank you. And of course, I wouldn't do this without the people of New Orleans who have been uh, just tremendous in giving me the ability to do the work that I do, uh, not only back home, but now as the President of the United States Conference of Mayors. And then finally, I'd like to just take a minute before I get into the gravamen of my talks to uh, thank my family. My beautiful wife, Cheryl, is here with us today. Uh, Cheryl is a practicing lawyer. She has been working every day of our life while together we have had five uh, beautiful children. Gracie is with us today and my youngest son, William. We left three of our kids home, uh, but I'm sure they're safe and I hope they're doing well. And I am, uh, I'm also joined today by my mother and my father uh, and three of my sisters and brothers. My father and my mother uh, were both born and raised in New Orleans. Uh, my dad graduated from law school in 1954. My mother was studying to be uh, a nun, and God had other plans for her and him. They were married and immediately went to the Pentagon, uh, where my father was serving in the JAG Corps. Uh, in the shadow of the Pentagon, my oldest sister, Mary, who is here with us today, was born. And over the next 11 years, my mother and my father had nine children. Uh, between us, we have 38 uh, nieces and nephews. My mother, my mother still looks like she's 29 years old. Uh, they raised us in a neighborhood called Broadmoor on the corner of Priya Street and General Pershing, Ward 12, Precinct 18. That got seared into our minds really early. Uh, but we lived on a wonderful street. We played in the street. Our yard was open to all of our neighbors. We were in the first integrated neighborhood in the city. I can remember very well on Sunday nights in front of the TV watching Bonanza, watching the wonderful world of Disney. Am I dating anybody in here? You remember that, right? Uh, it, was a, it was a great life. Uh, but my mother and father uh, taught us to reach out to other people, to help other folks. Uh, they subsequently raised their children. One of them was one of the youngest women ever to serve in the legislature. She served as state treasurer for eight years. She served as a United States senator for 16. My sister Mary Landrieu is here today <laughs> with her husband Frank, who was a parish president of Washita Parish. Uh, my sister Madeline is here, who served as a judge on the Fourth Circuit Court of Appeal, and next week will take over and become the new dean of Loyola Law School, who is with us today. My baby brother, the youngest of nine, who is the senior prosecutor in the U.S. Attorney's Office for street gang and violent crime, uh, is with us today with his wife, Carrie. Uh, Maurice, thank you for being with us. We're actually the slackers in the family. The other, the other five are home, you know, taking care of all of our children and our business. So I love you all, and I thank you all very much. I would not be here without you. I can't tell you how proud and honored I am to stand before you today as president of this prestigious and important organization. And I am here to say that America's greatness is alive and well in cities and towns across this country from urban to rural to suburban and from coast to coast. It is in our cities where Americans work. It is in our cities where Americans play where it's Little League or the pros, at a museum, in a park, shopping, or on Main Street. It's in our cities where we pray, in churches, in synagogues, in mosques, side by side, and in peace. It's in our cities where energy meets opportunity, where grit and determination produce incredible results, new jobs, innovation, entrepreneurship, 
It's in our cities where values like faith, family, and country still ring true today. And it is in our cities where hope hits the street. As the government closes to the ground, mayors are leading the way in issues both big and small. I don't have to tell you this. You've shown me, you've shown us. Mayor Levine did a great job highlighting how each of you is setting examples for our country. You're setting examples on how to rebuild American infrastructure, our roads, our bridges, transit, water systems. You're combating climate change in every corner and in every community in this country. You're connecting people to jobs and opportunity through education and training. Cities are also focused every day on making our country safe. And if you want to find a bipartisan, bicoastal pathway forward on immigration or health care, look no further than this very room itself. We can show America what leadership really looks like. This country is clearly hungry for results. And that is what a mayor delivers every day. We govern in real time. We govern in reality. We never step back when duty calls. We don't just talk about it. We just don't debate it because we don't have time for that. So while the cable news channels may train America's eyes on Washington, I want to tell our story. I want America to see what mayors have to offer. This is why earlier in this conference, we began to lay out a positive, bipartisan, national vision for our mayor's future, an agenda for America, our plan for action. And I come before you eager to share our plan of action with America, to show Washington what kind of partner we hope for in them, and excited about opportunities for mayors to define a better future for the people of this country, a future that secures families in every community, a future that rebuilds our most dangerous and crumbling infrastructure, a future that creates a stronger, more inclusive economy. A future that invests in fair, equitable, and healthy communities. A future that honors diversity, brings people together, and restores faith in public service for those who have been left behind for too long. In essence, this is about security. It's about jobs. It's about opportunities for America's families. This is about restoring the dignity and reputation that America has locally and globally. This is about improving the lives of all Americans. This is about making sure that we don't leave anybody behind because here is the hard truth and the eloquent beauty of our country. You see, none of us will truly live up to our full God-given potential unless all of us have the same opportunity. <laughs> Mayors, as I enter my final year of my second term as mayor and my 30th year of public service, I still cherish the opportunity to seek solutions and to find consensus. Hear me now. Compromise is not a dirty word. That is why I know our plan for action is right for America's future right now. But beyond the words on paper, our job is to deliver for our people. It's to put a face with the public policy that we create. This week, the Senate is likely to take up a vote on a bad health care bill that will only cause more confusion and anxiety in the people and for the people of this country. In my opinion, it will make us sicker and it will hurt the economy. It is a basic fundamental reality that less coverage means more burden on our cities, on our hospitals, in our ERs, and in our emergency response. And if Washington will just slow down, we, the mayors of America, can help get beyond Democrat and Republican politics and find the fixes necessary to protect over 20 million people who may lose health care if they keep going in the direction they're going today. We all believe here that that's a better way. So let's be honest, in these moments of uncertain, chaotic, and sometimes frustrating times, the families that we represent cannot look to Washington for answers. In this political climate, we as mayors must fight to occupy the radical center 
where idealism meets reality and where we put people over politics. And so we need to speak with one voice, with courage, with conviction, with honesty. And if we do, America will follow. When we work across party, it's good for our people. When we find common ground, we find neighbors who share the dream of a better future that we are all working for. We cannot simply resist and retreat. We must lead and we must engage. Now, whether we like it or not, we are bound together, sharing one destiny, one fate. You've heard it before, e pluribus unum. Out of many, we are one. Mayors, we know that America is not and has never been a survival of the fittest, zero-sum game, I win, you lose nation. That is not when we are at our best, but that is where we are now. Our founders declared that it is we the people, that we are indivisible with liberty and justice for all, not just for some, and that is the true genius of America. If you have faith in God, if you believe in our country, then you already believe that there is something bigger than ourselves and our own selfish interest. This is what Dr. King summoned us to when he said we are all tied together in a single garment of destiny. But when that garment gets ripped, it's up to us as the mayors. We are the ones that have to stitch it back together, one stitch at a time. If we are united, if we are indivisible, then we are strong. As President Clinton told us, this is about addition and subtracting, not subtraction, about multiplication, not division. And so this is where I want us to start. Too often we can be paralyzed by division, we can be overcome by indifference. In our country, there have always been demagogues with their own political agendas that will seek to divide us. They will try to pit people one against another, black against white, against Latino, gay versus straight, Republican, Democrat, rural, urban, north versus south. You've heard it many, many times before. As opposed to encouraging standing side by side, we too often fight over a little bit of meat on an otherwise empty bone. This is not the future that we want for our people. We know that if we are going to create opportunity, we have to be united as one. And if we can come together across race, across class, across geography, it would be a political tidal wave. We would be an unstoppable force in America, and our country would be better for it. Now, Mayors, I want you to stop for a minute and think about why we are here and who we are here to serve. Think about those who we have lost due to the attitudes of exclusion and divisiveness. Consider how much potential is denied because we remain isolated in our comfortable corners, afraid to extend a hand because of fear or indifference. How many more must be forsaken because we are not helping each other? How many more African-American kids have to be killed because our society does not value young black men? How many more parents have to lose their child to addiction or mental health illness because politics prevents us from finding funding solutions? How many more times will the relationship between the police and the community be strained because we judge both by an appearance and a uniform rather than by behavior? Mayors, this is why we must lead with courage. We must lead with conviction. We must lead with honesty. We must sow the seeds and till the soil if we expect to reap the fruits of our labor. We must match American exceptionalism with extraordinary deed. We can see that the country's solutions to this country's problems will not come from the halls of Congress, nor the boardrooms on Wall Street, but instead they will emerge from the main streets and byways of this great country. This is our wheelhouse. This is our playing field, and we will step up to the plate. You see, as Tom said, we are the inheritors of a great legacy, and with that comes great responsibility. 
We, in fact, stand on the shoulders of giants. Indeed, I am lucky enough to be the fifth mayor of New Orleans to serve as president of this incredible organization and the second one named Landrieu. As a young boy, I watched my father help integrate our great American city. It was his strength, his resolve, his clarity of vision, and his relentless focus on the people he served that inspires me still to this day. Daddy, I love you. It was Dutch Morial who became my first African-American man, then his son Mark H. Morial after that, who today is the president of the National Urban League. All three of these men led this organization and continue to set a great example. At every defining moment in our country, it has been mayors stepping into the breach to help American families. Mayor de Blasio the other day reminded us that in 1932, mayors were convened by Detroit Mayor Frank Murphy and later New York Mayor LaGuardia to respond to the Great Depression and to deliver aid to cities in partnership with Washington. Mayors like Andrew Young, Maynard Jackson in Atlanta, George Moscone, Diane Feinstein, Willie Brown in San Francisco, Jerome Cavanaugh in Detroit, and so many more across this country led the fight for civil rights and equality. You heard a minute ago that in the 70s, when my dad was president of this organization, this organization, along with Mayor John Lindsay and Abe Beam, convinced President Gerald Ford to help save a great American city from bankruptcy, and today New York sits as our north shining star for the entire nation. <laughs> After September 11th, Mayor Morial led this conference, and with Mayor Bloomberg turned New York around, D.C. responded, helped spur investments in homeland security that all of us share and benefit today. In New Orleans, Tom Cochran and Long Beach Mayor Beverly O'Neill worked out of my lieutenant governor's office to help us recover after Katrina. And Mayor Couch came down with mayors from across the country after the BP oil spill. Mayors have led this nation forward for generations. This mayor's is the legacy that we inherit and the responsibility that we know we now own. And today, we stand at another moment. We have to rise to the occasion that we find ourselves in. Together, we can reteach America a lesson that we all learned before, that everybody is the same, that everyone ought to be given the same opportunity and be expected to share the same responsibilities. We all have value in faith, in family, and country. We all want our kids to have a better life than we have had. The things that which unite us in our shared humanity make us stronger than anything that divides us. We cannot stay quiet when there's an injustice. Even if it's being perpetrated by people with great power, might does not make right. That is why we as a conference will speak with courage. We will speak with conviction. We will speak with honesty. Mayors, you have to use your powerful voices. Bring your leaders from Washington to the streets of America and carry the voices of your people to Washington with us. Show them how it's done without acrimony to better people's lives. We can do it. We must. Mayors, I have seen people come together in some of our highest and lowest moments. I have stood on the flooded streets of New Orleans after the federal levees broke following Hurricane Katrina, and I can attest to this truth. I saw it with my own eyes. When everybody is wet, when everybody needs to be saved, and everybody needs to be pulled out of the water, nobody worries about what boat they're going to get in. They just get in the damn boat. I saw in that moment of catastrophe when the entire civil government of the United States disappeared that African Americans and whites did not see color in that moment. When they had a common enemy, when they had a common threat, when they had a common opportunity, there was complete and total unity. I saw the whole world and all of you rally to our side to save a great American city and the soul of this nation. And despite the many, many challenges that New Orleans still has, my city, the city that I love unconditionally, is alive, it's well, and it is booming today.
My friends, we should not wait until the next catastrophe to bring our country together. We have to do it now. We can and we must. We have a special obligation to the people of America. And as President Kennedy told us directly to the mayors in 1963, you can set an example in your communities to which the timid can rally and which those clinging to the past cannot ignore. I know we have a lot of work to do. Our feet may be tired, but our soul is strong. Many of you have praised the speech that I gave about the Confederate monuments. I am very thankful for that. I don't deserve it, but I do appreciate it. But this is the one thing that was seared in my mind after being here this week. In a time of great turmoil, a mayor talked, and the nation listened. You can do the same. If you hear nothing other than this, take this home. Mayors, do not be afraid. When you speak, people will listen. When you act, people will join you. When you lead, people will follow. Mayors, this is our time to lead, and we will do it. When we speak with one voice, we break through the noise and the chaos. We calm the waters of our nation. When we speak with courage, we can be the voice of the American people. When we speak with clarity and honesty, we can make these times less uncertain and less chaotic. Our cities and our nation will be better for it. We will prove that we are a force to be reckoned with on behalf of the American people. Now, I will end where I began, with my parents, my mom and my dad. They taught all nine of their kids to love one another, to be just, to be fair, to be honest. They taught us to work hard and play hard, to be thankful, and to help others. These are good rules for life. And it turns out that they're good rules for governing as well. If my father were up here right now, he would tell me and you, you have political capital for a reason. Mayor Bloomberg said it earlier, use it. What else is it for? In these times, let's be bold because it is our time. Mayors, out of many, we are one. And when we are one, we are strong. Now, in what is clearly a moment of truth for our nation, we are called on once again to, pro to prove that this country can live up to the ideals set forth by our founding fathers. We are being called to duty, and we have to respond. Mayors, it is our time. Let's seize the moment, and let's get back to work. Thank you, and God bless you all. Okay, we'll fix to close this baby down but before we close it. Unfortunately, I have to highlight the rest of the day's events. <laughs> One of the things I want to do is I want to bring the Landrieu family up here for a photo. Let me mention that. So y'all go to the restroom. We'll be here when you get back. Uh, from 2.30 to 3.15, there's a host city workshop called our 5G Future with CEO of Sprint. This session will be informative and helpful, discussing the 5G networks, encouraging innovation in cities. The session will also discuss the One Million Project, which seeks to bridge the digital divide among U.S. students. Thank you to Miami Beach for organizing this great workshop. With that, I'd like to say that we will adjourn the 85th annual meeting of the United States Conference of Mayors. 
We look forward to seeing all of you. The leadership of this organization will be in August in New Orleans. And from then, we will be as strong as ever with the great leadership of Mayor Mitchell Andrew as our president. Thank you very much for being here. And thank you, Mayor Levine. So let's get, let's get the family up here. Thank you, sir. Mr. Worldwide to infinity, <laughs> you know the roof on fire. We go boogie, hoogie, hoogie, jiggle, wiggle, and dance, <laughs> like the roof on fire. We go drink drinks and take shots until we fall out, like the roof on fire. Now, baby, get my booty naked, take off all your clothes and light the roof on fire. Tell them, tell them, baby, 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 baby.